There was a little bit of a small crisis in my home this week. Uh, I found some contraband. You may find this hard to believe, but it comes in the form of literature, contraband literature. The title of this book is 101 Things to Do During a Dull Sermon. She's the guilty party right there. (laughs) I will not let this be distributed. (laughs) But crisis, um, we all, crisis is is a moment of decision. Those of you that are old enough remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, there was a lot of decisions that had to be made. There's, and crisis is just, it really is, it, if you look it up, it has that idea of decision time. And uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 7 says this, and he said with a loud voice, fear God, this is an angel speaking out, fear God, give him glory because of the hour of his judgment has come. And that word in the Greek is crisis. We draw the word, the English word, through Latin, right out of, the, out of the Greek, and so our word, English word crisis carries with it the same kind of weight that is there in the Greek, which is usually rendered judgment. And judgment is crisis. Judgment is decision. When, a ju- when somebody goes before a judge and there comes that point when he's heard the evidence and he, and he announces a decision, that's a judgment. That's a crisis. But there's lines that are, are defined, and then that's, that's it. There are no more. So I, I pray today that I can speak a little bit to this idea of judgment and crisis as it is in the Scriptures, as we see in Revelation chapter 14. But I'd like to ask the Lord for some help. So, Father, I do thank you that we have ability to be in this place at this time underneath your word. I pray that you allow me to use your word correctly. Holy Spirit, you're the master teacher, and I'm always fascinated, Lord, Holy Spirit, how you take parts of a message and you apply it to the hearts. Grant that mercy again this day, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Revelation chapter 14, the major theme of of the book of Revelation is really in focus here. And one of the major themes of the book of Revelation, unfortunately, it, it can come across as negative, But not all crisis, not all judgments are negative. We have been snowballed with the idea that all judgment is negative. But it's not. There's a positive and there's a negative in almost all judgments. Because in a court case, usually you have a plaintiff and a defendant, and both of them want to have the same outcomes, right? Uh Uh-uh. So, in the scriptures, we don't get bullied into the idea that, that the scriptures are judgmental and that all judgment is wrong. There's a good judgment. If you are accused falsely and then you go to court and prove that you're proved falsely, would that be a joyous day? Yes. Something on the other side, something on the other side of judgment tells you this is a good thing. So when we come to the book of Revelation with all of its fascinating symbolism, with all the apocalyptic ways of seeing these things, one of the things we've got to keep an eye on again is the idea that this is a conflict between God and man. Satan is a player in it. The beast and all these other characters that come in is a player in it. But it is really God and man in focus. And one of the things that we see in this book is, is judgment, but judgment isn't always bad. There is a positive side to judgment as well. So that's why I hope we can look at it a little bit. So the positive side of judgment, we can see this in chapter 14. I'm just going to read the first five verses together this morning and see this positive view of judgment here that we have. John writes, I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on a Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. 
These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. This is positive judgment. And I want to show you this because um, we, we've encountered this, this 144,000 before. That some, this is, seems to be a different 144,000. But in Revelation chapter 7, we also read this in verse 3. Do not harm the earth. This is one of the angels that comes for judgment. Do not harm the earth or sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their... So again, I want to point out this, that little term foreheads because we've seen this in chapter 13 and that's where I want to take the connection to next because I want us to keep this in mind that the mark of the beast is not the only mark that you... you, you you need to be looking at in the book of Revelation. Not the only forehead that you need to keep an eye on. Because in Revelation chapter 14, the 144,000 are marked as well. But who are they marked by? They're marked by God. See, many times we take a negative view and we keep on looking at the negative things. This book was meant for us as believers to encourage us. to Hold on to the testimony of Jesus. And in this chapter 14, we see that we have, those who know him, have had their foreheads. It, it says the name of his father is written on their forehead. They're marked. They're sealed. That idea of mark is this brand. I never grew up with cattle. And I, but just across the Missouri River in South Dakota, you, you know, if you have ever driven I-90, there's a sign as you go across the Missouri River and says, this is, you know, you're basically in cattle branding country as soon as you get across there. And you want to have a brand that is distinguished from everybody else's to, to keep your cattle separate. Well, that's what we see here. That's separation again. That's in, that's in judgment. Judgment separates out. Crisis sep- is a point of decision. Which side is the person on? That's what we see here. And so it says on verse 3, if you'll pay attention says, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000. Back up to chapter 3 and verse 17, and about the mark of the beast, says, no one will be able to buy and sell unless he has the mark. So this no one. But there's, there's two no ones here. They're separated. This is what we need to see here. That there's a judgment, and in judgment, there's a positive and there's a negative side to it. Chapter 13 gives very much the negative side of those who are on the wrong, if you could put it this way, the wrong side with God. But chapter 14 starts out with being on the right side with God. And this is, this is what we see here. This is positive judgment in the first part of 14. Romans chapter 11, 33 has this wonderful, wonderful verse. It's wonderful. It's not just a verse. It's, it's, it's a truth. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. God is a judge. And you can be on the right side with him or you can be on the wrong side with him. There's two sides to judgment. And it's his way. This is how he does it. Chapter 14 goes on, or verses 4 and 5. This is... (laughs) This is where it gets fun in Revelations, verses like verse 4. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. Okay, where's marriage in this? Is this about marriage then? I'm just like, what? Who are these 144,000? This is where cults go all over the place with this separating out. 144,000. Jehovah's Witnesses were really strong into this 144,000. Then they got more than 144,000. What they have to do? They had to stretch Scripture even more to meet their demands. We don't stretch Scripture to meet our demands. We take it as it is here. Is that, who, are, who are these people? Who are these? Um, what is this? Because I think within the context, we can see, I think there's a clue to what's being talked about here. And that clue is actually in verse 8. And another angel, a second one, follows saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. This is a new, an idea we'll unpack a little bit later in the book of Revelation more. 
She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of her passion and her immorality. So I believe these chaste ones in verse 5, 4 and 5 are talking about those who have not come on this, underneath the influence of Babylon, this adulteress. Um, God has uh, an exclusive, and I, I mean, I'm going to back up here real quick. We live in a very loose sexual age. Very loose. People can decide for themselves who they sleep with, when they sleep with, who, you know, gender, everything like that. It's just everything's really, really loose. This is the spirit of Babylon. This is, the, this is part of it. This is part of the spirit of Babylon. This rejection of God's standard for sexuality. God is very exclusive in his view of sexuality. Very exclusive. He has only one view, his own, and what he set up, male and female. But we live um, in this day and age of very loose sexuality, and it is in some ways the revolution that is governing much of what's going on in the United States of America right now. The trends, you can follow these sexual trends and you can see them go into all the moral grounds and how people decide. Is there a new morality? Yes. Is it, is it in some ways, in, I, I'm, be careful here, I don't, I don't think anything's more powerful than what God has said, but as a functioning thing, is the new morality just sweeping over the church? Unfortunately, yes. Many churches have succumbed to this. But the 144,000, this symbolic picture of the perfect number of people, will not give in to Babylon. And there is no lie in their mouth, and they are blameless before God. I believe this is the understanding of this context here. The other thing that I want to point out about these 144,000 is it is a wonderful thing, and that is that they have been purchased from the earth, it says in verse 3. They have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God, verse 4. And purchased is, is one of the beautiful things of Scripture, of being somebody who knows Jesus Christ. Did you know you were bought with a price? Those of you that know him, you were bought with a price. Peter does a really good job of this. He says it in 1 Peter chapter 1, 17 and 19, you address his father, the one who impartially, see that word again? Impartially judges, makes decisions about people, where they stand. According to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during your time on the stay on earth. How's that for how you live in northern Wisconsin? This is beautiful. Isn't it beautiful? How many of you are distracted by these doors being open? I'll close them if you need them. Oh, my wife. Don't close them. It's beautiful out. And it's kind of hard to think of living in fear right now here, right? But the fear is, is within soul. It's soul fear. You could put it that way. During time of stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. Blame grandma and grandpa if you can't blame your mom and dad. But with precious blood as a blam, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. We have been purchased by Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the purchase price. And he says here in Revelation, there, these have been purchased. God has taken them out. He has made a decision. And they're his. There's no falsehood. There's no pseudonyms. There's no, it's pseudo. There's no pseudo in them. There's no pretending. Their name is their name. Their person is their person. There's honesty. There's an, I, I can't get over again. One of the most important things for us to have in our lives is this real gut level honesty with ourselves before our God. Without honesty before God, there is no true healing. There's only hiding. And we know the deceiver will always try to keep us hidden from God. Well, I want to move on here. Um, oh, I, 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 we had some friends stop by. We, had, uh, we moved from Colorado 22 years ago, went to Iowa 13 years, been here nine years now. These are friends from back in Colorado days. Uh, wonderful, gracious people, but we have only seen them a handful of times in 22 years. 
and they were they found out well my wife found out they were traveling through highway two and gonna be a mile or just a block and a half from our house so she said hey why don't you stop by so we had lunch and i kind of waited for them to show up they told us what time it was going to show up and as I saw him drive by, looking, you know, how people, isn't it fun when these people are looking for an address? You got that, they got that look on their face. And I saw that look. And I knew I got to get out there and, and show them I'm here. And so they turned around, came back, and he gets out of the car and he says, well, how you doing? I says, that's a terrible way to say something. How you doing? That's too open-ended. And then he said this, are you still a follower of Jesus? I go, yeah, I am, man. I won't give up. And that's our greeting. That's our greeting. And uh, no falsehood between that man and I. Are you still a follower of Jesus? Wonderful. They're, they're, they're wrestling with things in life. They've got kids that are in, some in trouble. We've got, we got some kids that are in trouble too. But I ain't gonna, I'm not going to stop following Jesus. And it was just, just encouraging just encouraging to have him say that, because that's what I want. We're going to come back a little bit. And I'm going to look at real quickly a couple things in verses 6 and 7, but I want to I draw this back into something else here, and we're going to come back into communion with uh, in a little bit of this. Saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, verse 6 says, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. The gospel's for everybody. He said with a loud voice, fear God, give him glory. And I've, we've read this to start with, because the hour of his judgment has come. Decision time is here. Now notice this decision is not your decision or my decision. Whose decision is in question here? It's God's decision. He will show the deciding Jesus brought this out to light in one of the last things before he, he went to the cross. In Matthew chapter 25, we read these verses. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations, remember what it said in verse 6, every nation and tribe and tongue and people, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. That's a perfect picture of what God's judgment is like. Positive and negative. One to the one side, others to the other side. No middle ground. No fence sitting. This is judgment. This is God's separating. Crisis. Because that's the real root of, of that word. It's separating. Separating out. And Jesus picked that up with the shepherd separating goats and sheep. So the emphasis is on separating. In chapter 14, going back to Revelation, we now need to focus on negative judgment, which is verses 9 through 20. Being on the wrong... You can put it this way. Being on God's wrong side. You don't want to be on the wrong side of God. But here he has it. First, there's the false and dishonest life of worship that carries eternal condemnation. Verse 9, another angel, third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. This is judgment. This is negative judgment. Worship implies worthiness. Um, worship implies uh, the heart of attention towards something. Many of you are idolatrous worshipers of the Green Bay Packers. When you should worship the Broncos. Okay, you get what I'm talking about here, right? True and false worship. We don't want to ever confuse worship, though. What really has your heart? That's what you worship. Most people are self-worshippers. Let me put it, let me back it up. Many people are self-worshippers. 
worshipers. Remember what Paul said in the end times? People will be lovers of self. Self is a powerful, powerful thing. But it's, it's fueled by something. It's fueled by what, what satisfies their hearts, what they're looking for, what they long for, what they want to have. And here we have the mark of the beast. We've seen this in chapter 13. These people are undeniable. Again, this idea of mark on the forehead or on the hand, this idea of the mark is it, it's, it's absolutely undeniable identification. It is your ID. You can't escape it. That's kind of what it is. I, in fact, how literally do we take the mark on the forehead and on the hand? This has always been a, a thing within the church. And uh, like I said, one time I went to get an, a license plate, and the license plate in Iowa had, had I was going to get the number like A, and then it had 666. And a friend of mine worked the, the place and said, you probably don't want this one, do you? And I said, no, I don't want that one. I don't know if you could mark the beast in my car would have done anything. I don't know. But the fact is, is sometimes don't, don't, don't look too far down the road as far as this mark goes, here and here. I, there may be something here, but it's really the mark on your heart. The forehead is your mind. And it, but it, but what's, what, what we see in this is there's, the mark is a branding. It's an undeniable identification. When Jesus separates the goats and the sheep, do you think there will be any goats that will try to disguise themselves as sheep? Yes. But they will not escape the eye of God. They will not escape. Everything that we do is brought before him. No hiding before God. If there's no hiding before him, what should we do then? Run to him. Not away from him. Run to him. Tell him everything. That's a little application. But here we see judgment is, uh, is inevitable. Judgment is the imagery of the harvest. And we see this coming down. And I know I'm going pretty fast over some things. We're going to come back to verse 12 and 13 here in a little bit too. Verse 14 says, And then I looked, behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. One of the things I find fascinating here is, um, this is an imagery of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's got a sharp sickle in his hand. But he doesn't swing it until an angel says to him, do it. Who's an angel to tell Jesus what to do? Did anybody else see this in here? Maybe I'm being freaky about this. It's because, remember how Jesus, when Jesus said he came, he says he only does the will of the Father. And does Jesus know the end of the time, according to his own testimony? Who knows that? The Father does. And, and, and here we get to see a little bit of this picture that Jesus responds in obedience to the Father's will who uses an intermediary of, of an angel to say this. Now, I may be reading too much into this. I don't think so. God has order. God is not disorderly. God has order. And so what we see here, though, is this biggest thing is in picture here is that this is the, the reaping of, of what people have sown. And that the gospel brings judgment as well as it brings um, salvation and, and clarity, or I mean freedom, you could put it, righteousness. I'll just read the last few verses here of chapter 20, or verse uh, 14. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has the power over fire, came out from the altar. He called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth. Again, important. Verse 15, harvest of the earth, vine of the earth. Verse 19, so the angel swung his sickle to the earth, gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth, threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God, and the winepress was trodden outside the city. Blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for the distance of 200 miles. That was a very impressional verse to this young man when he was 14 or 15 years old. Blood up to the bridle, 200 miles. That's like Lake Superior. 
Now again, in this book, this apocalyptic book, is this how where's the literal, where's the literal, where's the figurative? And I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't quite know where this is. There's many who teach that this is the Battle of Armageddon and that the blood will literally flow that deep. Can't say, I don't know. But the main picture that we're looking at here again is that judgment is coming. Crisis is coming. Point of decision is coming. And who is the final decider? God is the final decider. See, I think sometimes we, we think we're the major decider. This is, this is, if you've ever heard of a philosophy called existentialism, this is the, the crux of existentialism. I am what I decide I am. Uh, my, who I am is made just by, our, by my decisions. Do you hear that out in our culture anywhere? Oh, man, it's everywhere right now. I am the decider. I make the decisions. God makes the decisions. The one thing that we need to be aware of is where do we align with him? Where do we align with his decisions? Where do we align with him? Do we have what we, saw, what we see earlier in this chapter when it says this, here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Verse 12, and I heard the voice of heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow after them, and they will be shown to be guileless without blame, because they've been purchased by God. So we're going to come to the communion table here in a few moments. Um, But I don't want to escape the weight of this chapter in that it talks about this crisis that is coming. A crisis of decision, God's decision, but subset under that, we do have some deciding to do. We do make decisions. Somebody decided to open these doors this morning. Was it a good decision? Somebody decided to turn the fans on this morning. Was it a good decision? I didn't like God's decision on Thursday. It was 54 degrees here in northern Wisconsin. I about went stir crazy. Yeah, I was waiting for that. I will say this. God says put a jacket on. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Wear him. Know him. Because there needs to be an answer for judgment. There needs to be an answer for God's wrath against sin. Because there's not many songs, modern praise songs, that sing songs about verse 19. So the angel swung a sickle on earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press, or the great wine press of the wrath of God. Let's sing to the wrath of God today. You can go to Second Tim, or Second Thessalonians chapter one, and Paul talks about to the Thessalonians. And he encourages them and says, "God knows how. God knows how to hold your enemies in place, and He will bring judgment upon them someday. Hold on." Peter does this in chapter 4, I think, in, in, in 1 Peter. He talks to the believers and says, you're, gonna, you're suffering now, you're suffering now, but hold on. God knows how to judge. He knows how to separate the sheep and the goats. The great winepress of the wrath of God. God can only do one thing with sin. Punish it relentlessly punish it. And he does. But there are two places of judgment. I've said this many times, don't tire of saying it. There are two places of judgment that God meets out. That's why this symbol that we celebrate is so important. Because Jesus Christ 
took upon himself all the wrath of God upon himself for Keith's sin. I'm just using me. Sin must be judged. God never makes peace with sin. We do. He doesn't. So judgment must come at two places. There are two choices to choose and and hold on and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and and what he's done on the cross or to take your chances. Stand before the white throne of, of judgment someday and convince God you're good enough to get in on your own. Hebrews 2, 14 through 17, we read of this place of judgment. Therefore, since children share in the flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And we've seen the devil in the, in, you know, Satan is, is one of the prominent pictures in Revelation. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had that power, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. This is, the, this is the primary slavery in the world. There are slaves. There are literal slaves in the world. But the, the primary slavery in the world is people being afraid of death. And they should be. Because death is separation. I've been separated from my mom and dad. I can't go to their house anymore. 404 South Union. Sit down and have a cup of coffee with them anymore. Can't do it. Separated from them. Cemeteries are a place that help us to see death is separation. But this is the separation that's more fearful, is separation from God. For surely he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. I'm one of those. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful, faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, and this to make a propitiation for the sins of the people. And I know some of you... Get tired of me talking about propitiation, but I think it's absent from our culture as a church. We need to see it again. That word means that the wrath of God was taken out on Jesus Christ. Christ took upon himself God's wrath for sin for all who will trust him and believe that they are a sinner before a holy God and cannot stand before him, but we can stand in the faith of Jesus Christ. Know him. 1 John chapter 4, we read this. By this love, God has manifested in us. The love of God manifested in us. That God has sent his only begotten Son of the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to take his wrath out on him instead of me. That's freedom. It's a choice. Do you know this one, Jesus? Today could be a day to know him. To recognize that before God, you have no standing. You'd be on your own. I don't want you to be on your own before God. Take to yourselves the Savior Jesus Christ. and Rejoice in him. Be thankful that God has sent his son. The other place that God will mete out judgment is in hell. And that's what's in picture in chapter 14 when it talks about the mark of the beast and those whose torment goes up forever and ever. The Bible does not speak about annihilationism. There are people who teach annihilationism. In other words, when a person dies, they don't know God. They just go off into nothing. I don't believe the Bible teaches that at all. This in chapter 14 is one of those places where we see there's something eternal about this punishment. So when we come to this table, one of the things that we get to do is we get to remember there was a crisis, a decision. And that decision was that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That by simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, one is in righteous standing with God. And in that righteous standing then, is to open up life to us. Even this nasty life that we live in here is once in a while, right? When I find books like 101 Things to Do During a Dull Sermon. That cut way down here. Deep. And it twisted it a little bit. Hey, 
Who said the amen? We get to come, remember, this is what this is for, to remember that God's wrath has been satisfied. That when we take, when this cup is passed among us, when we take this cup, it's a, a recognition of what part of Jesus is blood shed for us. And when we take, his, when we take the bread, what's it represent to us? That his body was, gave his body for he went all He was fully God, fully man, and he took our place, and by faith in him, we stand right with God the Father Almighty. And we don't have to fear what? Hell. And we can live life. Amen? Can I have the brothers who are going to help me distribute come on up here right now? Steve, will you help? So we do it this way at Grace Bible Fellowship. Uh, we take the bread to ourselves individually, uh, remembering that was Jesus thinking about you when he died on the cross? This always boggles my mind. I can't keep three things going in my mind at a time. But he did. He knows you. He died for you. So we take the bread to ourselves. And then we take the cup and we hold it and we do it together. This is, this is just how we do it here. There's no set place in that way. But he did something amazing. So when Dan Van Ryan stops at my house this, yesterday, and he says, do you still love Jesus? He put us together. He put the church together. We're here for each other. That's why being part of a church is so important. There, there's not, there should be no individual hermit Christians, I don't think. We belong to each other. We belong together. So we take communion together because Jesus put us together. That's why we do it. So please come. Father, we thank you that you've given us this. And uh, Holy Spirit, may you be honored with the hearts that come this day. Any who truly know you, Lord, let them come. And even those who today made a decision to believe on you, Lord, know that they've crossed from death and into life. Know that the crisis has been there. And they can, they can believe on you and trust you for their eternity. May they come as well. Lord, we love you. We thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love. In Jesus' name, amen. Please come.